tonight. The Republican National Convention kicks off after Donald Trump survives an assassin's bullet. The latest on efforts to piece together Saturday's deadly shooting. Plus, a country divided. Christian leaders urge Americans to turn to God and unify the nation. And while Israel continues its war against Hamas, Jewish students learn how to fight anti-Semitism in America. There's a battle going on here in Israel, and there's also a battle going on in college campuses. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. Donald Trump is officially the Republican nominee after surviving an assassination attempt. Good evening and welcome to Faith Nation. From our CBN studio in Washington, I'm Caitlin Burke. Not only is former President Donald Trump the official Republican nominee, he also made his choice for vice president, tapping Ohio Senator J.D. Vance as his running mate on the first day of the Republican National Convention. Vance is a Trump loyalist who was elected to the Senate in 2022 and is expected to energize the GOP base. He's a businessman and author of the popular memoir, Hillbilly Elegy. Joining me now is CBN chief political analyst, David Brody. David, what do you make of Trump's VP pick and what do you think that that does for this race? Well, Caitlin, there's a lot to unpack here. First of all, it makes perfect sense if you're talking about policy and the MAGA mantle. I mean, J.D. Vance is a populist. He combines isolationism with economic populism. Uh, so he jives with President Trump uh, on policy. So he could be a guy at 39 years old, he turns 40 this summer, to be someone who is the next generation MAGA mantle holder. Uh, there's that. He also brings to the ticket, you mentioned Hillbilly Elegy, which, by the way, I saw that movie. It's with Glenn Close. Excellent. It's about his low socio, his socioeconomic low-income upbringing. Uh, he's got quite a story to tell uh, with that, and that could play well in places like Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, and uh, I'm sorry, Wisconsin, some of those Rust Belt uh, states, uh, because he's from the Rust Belt, and he speaks kind of, in a way, their language, if you will. And I don't mean it in any derogatory way. I just simply mean uh, he's very relatable, and it's important in those swing states. Uh, so he has that. Now, look, uh, we can. Uh, there's a long list of negative comments that J.D. Vance has made about Donald Trump in the past. He has called him. He says he's been a never Trump guy. This is all 2016 and before. Uh, he also said he called Trump an idiot, reprehensible, called him a fraud. You can be sure the Biden campaign at some point, not right now because of the assassination attempt, but at some point we'll use that uh, going forward. Since then, J.D. Vance has had a turnaround, said he was totally wrong about President Trump and is fully on board. After the assassination attempt this weekend, Trump says he's been given a chance to bring America together. What do we need to hear from him this week to take steps towards actually doing that? And is that possible? Well, I think that's all up to Donald Trump and also, of course, uh, President Biden and the Democrats. But let's start with Trump. This week is going to be a reset. He has thrown away the campaign speech. He has said that. In other words, uh, or excuse me, the convention speech that he was set to read on Thursday. He says, forget it. We're doing a national unity speech. He says this is the time because of what happened to him on Saturday with the assassination attempt. So we see what happens on, on Thursday of this week. And then going forward, we'll see if he adheres to that for the rest of the campaign. My sense is this is a different Donald Trump this time around compared to 2020, 2016. Yes, he's still Donald Trump. Uh, yes, he's got grievances. Yes, everybody's against him. He'll, you'll hear all of that. Uh, but there also seems to be a sense that he's a changed man ever since the assassination attempt. We'll see. And the reason I say a changed man, Corey Lewandowski, his former campaign manager, uh, said that to me this morning. He said, look, he believes that Donald Trump, this has changed Donald Trump. We'll see if it, if it holds uh, true. Quickly, David, about 30 seconds. Trump had a major legal win today with a federal judge, ju judge dismissing the classified documents criminal case against him. What does this mean for him at this point? Well, it just means that, well, obviously, it's not going to be tried anytime. Well, it won't be tried before the election because there's no case anymore. But beyond all of that, it's just another uh, instance of Donald Trump winning. You know, he always says, you're going to be so sick of winning. We're going to do so much winning. I think that's what this looks like. Once again, another uh, 
a, belt, a notch in the belt for Donald Trump. All right, David Brody, thanks so much for your insights. You bet. The FBI continues to search for a motive behind that assassination attempt on former President Donald Trump. Investigators are looking at the gunman's phone for clues as new details emerge about the moments before the shooting. Attendees frantically notified security officials that the suspect, 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks, was on a nearby roof at the rally in Pennsylvania. A local law enforcement officer actually scaled the building and found Crooks before retreating back down a ladder. Just minutes later, the first gunshots rang out and grazed Trump's ear. Questions remain over how the shooter was able to get a clear shot in the first place. Expected that local law enforcement at the direction of the Secret Service, would have been positioned on those rooftops. You allocate one to more likely two to three officers to take positions along that rooftop or that roof line. Um, but that apparently wasn't done. Two people in the crowd were critically injured, another killed. Today, the Republican National Convention begins in Milwaukee just 48 hours after that assassination attempt. Going into this week, an expected change in tone after Trump's near-death experience. Senior correspondent Wendy Griffith is here with more. Wendy? Caitlin, the former president moving full steam ahead after telling supporters it was God alone who prevented the unthinkable from happening. The Secret Service says it is confident in its updated security plans put in place following Saturday's shooting. The designation that we have here in the city of Milwaukee for this convention is a national special security event. It is the highest designation that uh, our federal government provides for an event of this caliber, of this magnitude. Trump says he's now reworking his convention speech, telling the Washington Examiner, this is a chance to bring the country together. I was given that chance. Yeah, I talked to President Trump today. He was in great spirits. I mean, he was telling me an unbelievable story about hearing the bullet actually come at him and go to his ear. He's upbeat. He's excited about coming to Milwaukee. My fellow Americans. Speaking to the nation Sunday night, President Biden asked Americans to lower the political temperature. There is no place in America for this kind of violence, for any violence ever, period. Investigators say the man suspected of firing the shot Saturday is Thomas Matthew Crooks, a 20-year-old who worked at a nursing home. He was a registered Republican and had no known history of mental illness and no criminal history. The FBI says it's confident Crooks acted alone. The Secret Service is also facing major questions as to how the shooter got so close. A direct line of sight uh, like that um, to the former president should not occur. We, meanwhile, tonight's events will feature high-profile conservative leaders and elected officials, including Charlie Kirk from Turning Point USA, Governors Glenn Youngkin from Virginia, Kristi Noem from South Dakota, and Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. Caitlin? Thanks, Wendy. After Saturday's attack, both Republicans and Democrats are urging Americans to tone down political discourse. And in an address from the Oval Office last night, President Biden said politics should never be a violent battlefield. George Thomas has more. In an Oval Office address, President Biden urged Americans to take a step back and reject violence, saying that politics should never be a killing field. We stand for an America not of extremism and fury, but of decency and grace. All of us now face the time of testing as the election approaches. And the higher the stakes, the more fervent the passions become. This places an added burden on each of us to ensure that no matter how strong our convictions, we must never descend into violence. Democratic Senator Chris Coons of Delaware, who is part of a prayer group that regularly meets on Capitol Hill, believes we simply cannot see each other as enemies, irrespective of our different political views. All of us are reaching out to each other in Congress. As you know, I'm an active member uh, of our senatorial prayer group that tries to not just um, lower the temperature, but to be role models to each other of how to respect each other as people. A similar sentiment echoed by South Carolina's Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, who is thankful knowing just how close the former president came 
to possibly losing his life. On Sunday, Trump wrote on Truth Social, it was God alone who prevented the unthinkable from happening. I was just grateful that he made it. I mean, fate stepped in, God, the hand of God, call it whatever you like. But for the country, we probably need to do some soul searching as a nation. In a statement, former First Lady Melania Trump expressed thanks for those who have reached out beyond the political divide to send their support. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders calling political violence un-American urged citizens to perhaps take a different view of the process. The bottom line is what we need as a nation, what a democracy is about, is not radical rhetoric. What it is about is a serious discussion of where we are as a nation and how we go forward. You know, in, in a certain way, Kristen, politics should be kind of boring. Meanwhile, security experts continue to sound the alarm about growing political violence in our culture, warning that threats against local and state office holders have jumped sharply in recent years. This is the most complex, dynamic, and dangerous threat environment that I've experienced in the 40 years that I've been working in law enforcement and homeland security. We are an angry, uh, divided nation, uh, and that anger and division has uh, become intertwined in our political discourse. There are a growing number of people in this country who believe that violence is an appropriate way to express their ideological or political views. Trump is now in Milwaukee for the Republican National Convention. He told the New York Post, I want to try to unite our country, but I don't know if that's possible. People are very divided. Evangelist Greg Laurie urged people to pray for our nation and its leaders, writing on X that America stands at a pivotal crossroads, and now more than ever, we need God, we need the Bible, and we need the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. George Thomas, CBN News. Coming up, anger, division, and violence. How to pray for America when we come back. Welcome back. Saturday's horrific shooting shocked Americans and revealed just how divided our nation has become. As we've mentioned, it's prompting calls from political leaders to tone down the rhetoric and unite ahead of November's election. Christian leaders say we need God to heal America. Joining us now is Justin Gibney, president of the AND campaign. Justin, thanks for coming on. Let's start with how did we get here? This weekend's shooting really showing us how divided we are as a country. What do you think is driving this? I think it's a sense of desperation. Uh, both sides think that everything is on the line with this particular vote. And uh, we've just been showing that we haven't handled it well, that we haven't been able to put things into perspective to say this election matters and who wins matters. But there's something bigger, and we need to relate to each other in a better way, even if we disagree, and we just haven't been doing that well. What is not needed from Christians right now in the wake of the shooting at the Trump rally? I think vitriol, uh, coming up with excuses. One thing that I said is when anytime you see political violence, it needs to be condemned, and it needs to be condemned without qualification, without equiv uh, equivocation, or without giving a lecture about how bad the other side is. It needs to be very clear that this is unacceptable and that we need to move forward in a better way. But too often, we cloud that message with a lot of other things. What kind of influence could Christians have on American politics if we do handle this well going forward? Well, we in the AND campaign have really been telling Christians to come forward with sobriety. Uh, emphasizing uh, the human dignity of the people that we're against. Look, we can have some very serious conversations and be, be tenacious in our advocacy for things like life, uh, for people who are in poverty, while at the same time having a certain level of respect. So I think civic pluralism and showing civility is something that can be a major, uh, uh, a major message that, uh, that Christians can bring, being the salt and the light in the public arena, and that's exactly what's needed. In this election season, unfortunately, anyone on the opposite side that we're on may come across as an enemy. As Christians, how do we love each other well? Well, I think to understand that someone isn't defined by their vote, uh, that people are not just political abstractions, that they have testimonies, that they're going through different things, and we cannot just judge them by our disagreements in politics. That's a major step that we could say to say, you know what, I may disagree with you, and I'm going to publicly say that when I need to, 
but I'm going to do it in a certain way. And I'm going to realize that I still have to acknowledge the dignity and that you are an image bearer. And I think Christians have to do that under all circumstances. In the last about 30 seconds that we have left, what are some practical steps that Christians can take this week to reflect Christ? Uh, I would say that approaching someone that you know you may disagree with and telling them, you know, that you value them, that you may have your disagreements, but that you want to hear them out and you want to understand where they're coming from. Too often, we argue with people without even knowing their, their full argument, with just understanding the character of them. So I think building relationships and even defending people that we disagree with is a really good start uh, to something that needs to be, uh, that we need to be a model of moving forward. All right, Justin Gibney with the AND campaign. Thank you so much for coming on. Really important perspective. Thanks for having me. Coming up, the latest on Israel's war against Hamas when Faith Nation returns. Israel is increasing the pressure, <clears throat> excuse me, on Hamas after a weekend strike in Gaza killed dozens of Palestinians who were sheltering in a designated safe zone. Israel said the strike targeted two Hamas terror chiefs. One is confirmed dead, the other still missing. Hamas claims the attack killed 90 people, including civilians. Israel says most of the dead were terror operatives. Hamas is being worn down every day, paying prices, and its ability to re-strengthen is very low. Israel and Hamas are still negotiating a hostage ceasefire deal despite the ramped up fighting. More than 100 hostages remain in captivity. When, Israel, when protests broke out in Israel last spring, U.S. college campuses became dangerous places for Jewish students. Now some of those students are preparing to fight back. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell has the story. These young men just took the prize for best proposal to promote Jewish life when they begin their freshman year at college this fall. Our aim is to involve Jews who are, just aren't really connected with the Jewish community at Maryland. A half dozen entries presented proposals in a Shark Tank format at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. My project, Soup for the Soul, was about broadening the Jewish community by showing that we're really inviting and caring. We take care of one another. Even outside of the Jewish community, we're taking care of you. The competition culminated a program by Nitzavim Fellowship. The word Nitzav in Hebrew actually means stable really fixed, solid. So we're here celebrating the completion of a course of advocacy and Jewish leadership skills. These high school students are spending part of a gap year here before entering university. So we have 80 students that are going back in the fall to 30 different secular campuses and their objective and they're targeted and they're ready and they're planned is not just to be Jewish students, Chris, they're here to be Jewish student leaders. And they've all come up with some kind of a way to make a meaningful difference in Jewish life Jewish learning, Jewish identity on campus. It's just a very wonderful thing when you think that these students are here on their gap years. They know what's raging in America, which is a whole lot of anti-Semitism on campus. And so this organization has invited these students to come up with innovative ideas to try and go back to college, go to college and combat anti-Semitism create more community for them to feel safer. I think it's incredibly creative. It's sad that they need to think this way, but this is where we are. The recent explosion of anti-Semitism on college campuses makes this coming semester challenging and is driving this program. Rabbi Adi Isaacs began Nitzavim Fellowship to empower gap year students to grow in confidence and inspire change on their campuses. Tonight was really amazing. It was an unbelievable celebration of students that are here in Israel about to go to college campus next year. We know what college campuses are like in America right now and anti-Semitism, anti-Israel sentiments, but these students, just seeing them after a full year of getting ready to go onto college campus and celebrate together of their accomplishments and their passion, it's unbelievable. They know that they're not facing an easy battle. Um, we tell them that there's a battle going on here in Israel, and there's also a battle going on in college campuses, and it's very different. We encourage them to stay, but if they do go, they need the tools to do so. They need the proper tools to stand up for Israel. 
to be a strong ambassador for Israel and for the Jewish people, and to just be united, Jews together on campus. The tools taught and practiced are very timely. We've been starting recently, is starting off every class with just spewing out things that we've been seeing trending on social media. Israel are, is baby killers, Israel's committing genocide, Israel are white colonists, and breaking down each claim so how to respond? If someone walks by you in class and you know yells that in your face, how do you respond? When to have a conversation, when not to have a conversation? Yeah. Um, just simple things like that. Kayla Kupieski feels better prepared for her upcoming semester at Columbia University. When I started and heard about this program, I knew that there would be anti-Semitism on college, and I knew that going to a secular college was going to be hard. But I never thought something like October 7th would happen, and all the more so is Netzavim important. Now, I have a cohort of students, not only at Barnard and Columbia with me, but colleges all around America, who will be there for me if I have any questions or need any support, and will always be there to work together to combat anti-Semitism and bring more Jews closer to Judaism. Aliza Ben Shalom, the Jewish matchmaker seen on Netflix, served as one of the four judges. I was very impressed and it was so much fun. I love this. I love I love energy. I love ideas. I love inspiration. I love uh, that that students want to make a difference and they have an idea that they're going to follow because that to me, that's that's the golden nugget. Like if you know who you are and you know what you want, you can chase it and make it happen. As these students head off to a potential lion's den this fall, they, like Daniel of old, can look to the God of Israel to sustain them. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, free treats for good grades. That story next on Faith Nation. Finally tonight, a New York City deli owner is incentivizing kids to get good grades, and it's going viral. Bodega owner Well Al Sui promised a 12-year-old boy named Zamir Davis free treats if he made good grades. So when the seventh grader got a spot on the honor roll, Al Sui delivered on his word. Look at this, second mark kid. Wow, yo man, you doing good, man. Yo, Zamir, what do you want, what do you want, man? I'll show you what I want to put on. Zamir walked out with a handful of treats and encouragement from Al Sui to never give up. That is gonna do it for Faith Nation tonight. We will see you tomorrow.